Jay-Z is serious business. Um, and in case you didn't hear, he got a private jet for Father's Day. So I'm going to tell my wife that my Father's Day gifts needs to be upgraded for next year. That's One actually the jet. Like, that's this actual Jay-Z's jet. And it's a nice jet. And it's not all jets are this nice. But his is this nice. Um, why would someone like Jay-Z use a private plane? Why is general aviation, private aviation useful for someone like him? Well, lots of reasons. <clears throat> First of all, um, it will go like 500 miles an hour. If nothing else, for business people, being able to move around the country at 500 miles an hour on their schedule, as you can imagine, is an incredible advantage. Um, I mean, the man doesn't just write music. Um, he's involved in a number of other business deals. <clears throat> I think he has a bar, or he had one in, in Las Vegas. Um, being able to move around and do deals at 500 miles an hour, incredibly advantageous. It's an extremely private and discreet form of travel. If you've never flown privately, I mean, not on a fantastic jet like that. If you've never have, it's really an experience. I mean, I fly a little piston engine, you know, single engine plane. But when I fly into McCarran, I fly in and I go, I don't go to the public terminals with the TSA and the bomb sniffing dogs and the x-ray machine. I go to the executive terminal. Someone welcomes me to Las Vegas, drives me, you know, from the ram in a little cart over to the, to the marble floored lobby. I mean, they treat me like I'm the president or something. But needless to say, it's very discreet. Um, there's, uh, and everyone there is trained, to, you know, to not typically not talk about who comes through. That's kind of part of the expectation an executive terminal is, uh, it's a discreet form of travel. So, extremely discreet way to travel, which, as you can imagine, someone of a certain level of popularity, for better or for worse, really can't travel, um, you know, on Southwest. It's extremely challenging. Um, just, you get mobbed with people, right? Justin Bieber can't fly coach anymore, I imagine, or first class for that matter. I mean, he's met at, he's mobbed as soon as he gets off the plane, imagine on the plane. That's advantageous. Likewise, with private aviation, you can drop into the hundreds or thousands of small airports that have no commercial service of any kind. While, the, for example, where I live, the nearest airport with commercial service is about uh, 40 minutes away. The nearest little airport that I could get a private jet into is maybe 10 minutes. So already there's all this time I'm saving. Uh, owning a private jet, even in some of the ads, is, is like having a little time machine. Sometimes ads talk just like that. It's like owning a little time machine. Likewise, there's no TSA. Uh, there's no bomb sniffing dogs. There's no tetrahertz x-ray machines. Of course, it may not be your lawyer who wanted to find out where you are. Um, it could be a process server, an ex-wife, the IRS, the paparazzi. Lots of people would like to know where these interesting business people, celebrities are. Um, since 1991, the FAA has provided uh, flight plan and aircraft positioning data to organizations that they deem that have a legitimate need to know. It's called the ASDI, or ASDI, the Aircraft Situation Display to Industry. Basically, the ASDI is a stream of aircraft positions, including their speed, heading, altitude, flight plan information, um, for every, basically every plane on a flight plan in the United, in the United States it's national airspace system. With the advent of widespread internet access, sites like FlightAware <clears throat> have appeared which make use of, a, of the ASDI data to provide visualizations of aircraft positions on a map, along with the ability to search for specific information on a plane. Um, this also includes um, long running history. I think uh, FlightAware has been around for seven years. They save all the data, so they have basically seven years of flight plan information. Yeah, I love it. It says, want a full history of some plane, this is Mark Cuban's plane, dating back to 1998. Buy now, get it within an hour. Yeah, they have millions and millions of records, which they, they indicate on their site very clearly. So, how do we reference a specific plane? Well, planes have unique identifiers called tail numbers. Um, every plane has one. It's usually on the tail. They consist of... Not a this one. Yeah, not this one. Sorry, when you have awesome engines like that, it bumps the tail number. Um, it's, uh, in, for all U.S. registered planes, it starts with N. Sometimes it's called the N number, though for planes registered outside the U.S., it starts with some other number. And the mapping from tail number to entity owning it is public. Absolutely. FlightAware provides it, too. You mouse over it, and it shows you yeah. the owner's information. You can find out who, uh, what's the tail number of Rush Limbaugh's plane if you want. It's very secret, as you can tell, in sarcasm. Where's the sarcasm close tag? Uh, the tail numbers are used all over the place. Flight plans, air traffic control, radio communications. They're kind of like the plane's license plate number. Uh, suddenly, with ASDI data more conveniently accessible via websites like FlightAware to the public, uh, privacy provided by private aviation largely vanished. Because remember, ASDI doesn't just provide current positioning for where the plane is. It's hard for the paparazzi to reach you at 35,000 feet on your private plane. Um, 
they include information on future flights because flight plans are usually uh, filed in advance and they become instantly available in the ASD stream. So what happens is I file a flight plan to, uh, right now for tomorrow morning. That data is immediately available with my proposed uh, departure time and destination and arrival time. I mean, the paparazzi can suddenly get ready, or your lawyer, or your process server, or the guy that wants to repossess your plane, which happens. Apparently, there's, there's people who specialize in this. With the, with the downfall of the uh, real estate market, for a while, like every real estate guy owned a plane. And then they lost, you know, their cash flow dried up uh, with the fall of the housing market. And there was a bunch of people who cropped up who actually go and repossess planes. They, like, show up. I imagine they're like Dog the Bounty Hunter, but with a pilot's license. That's the way I picture them. Because planes don't have keys, as it turns out, which is weird. Um, if you can get the door open, which requires like a screwdriver, you just like engine start. It's like a Prius. I got one more. Okay. FlightAware will send you an email alert for free for any plane you want to sign up for. So you want to watch somebody who's interesting, you just put in your email address and the planes you want to watch. They'll let you know when they're wheels up, wheels down, when they file the flight plan. So that's how your filthy attorney knows where you are. So yeah, so naturally when FlightAware became popular in early 2000s, uh, private aircraft was kind of dissatisfied with this. So um, there, the, 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 the bar was created. The bar is this list of block tail numbers. Um, it's, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the bar is this list of tail numbers that if you're subscribed to the SDI feed, uh, you're not allowed to publish any information relating to them. So if you type in a uh, tail number uh, that's on the bar into FlightAware, you just won't see anything. Let it's me read you the way they describe it. <clears throat> the bar blocks aircraft movements from public dissemination upon request. Yeah. It was instituted in 2000, just when the internet became popular by the NBAA, which is a lobbying group for the, uh, for, you know, rich people with planes. Rich Peoples has their advocacy groups, like anybody. Um, you know, NRA for gun owners, PETA, um, NAMBLA, I guess. There's, there's... <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad guys, though I will say their PR guy was not nice in his yeah. response to us doing this talk. <laughs> so yeah. in the uh, Forbes uh, article he's quoted, he's not thrilled with us. So anyway, so the bar is free to sign up for. You don't need any justification to put yourself on it. In 07, uh, the, tried to, the con Congress tried to impose uh, you having to show a valid security concern, but the second that happened, oh sorry, not 07, 11, um, but the, the second that happened, the NBA tried began advocacy efforts and they succeeded and the that's still that provision was repealed yeah they claim they immediately began advocacy efforts on the aircraft owner's behalf yeah so these guys are hurting right now friends. if you're like jay-z you're probably on the bar uh, pretty much everyone is let and me so put it to you this way we have i have clients with private aircraft they're not even that interesting um okay if they hear that you're super interesting all the time um <laughs> But, I mean, they do mundane things, right? But um, they routinely put themselves on the bar. There's no reason not to. It costs nothing. Um, you don't need to demonstrate a valid security concern. You don't have to say that, you know, like Mexican drug lords are looking to kidnap you or anything. You just go, I want to be blocked, and you're blocked. Uh, just if you were here for Enderman's talk, um, he was talking about trying to track people on the bar using ADSB, right? And, well, they least Which possibly a good idea. do that. And ADSB is awesome, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it, as is obvious. But the problem is that there's very, very, very low penetration on private aircraft because, I mean, it's, it's private. Like in your car, you don't have to tell the, the feds about your car's GPS. And so people like uh, private aircraft owners are also very strongly against talk, telling everyone about whether they have ADSB installed on their plane or not. The essential problem is that oh, it's, it's not going to be mandated on private aircraft until 2020. So you can't really track all the interesting people using ADSB. And even by 2020, let's be honest, do you remember the switch to uh, digital television over the air? How many times was that pushed back? I um, mean, that was relatively cheap, and they were giving away the things for free. And like I said, even uh, the, in, the NBA has tons of, a lot of power, like the NRA. They're very influential. All right. So we were just kind of, so yeah, you can't, it seems like it's pretty hard to track people on the bar as of right now. You can go do this, but. Yeah, it, I mean, you, you, you aren't allowed to publicly disseminate their information according to the agreement, you know, if you uh, like are flight aware or something. Now listen to this. Henderson Tower, Skyhawk 7350 Kilo Delta. It's really hard to hear, isn't it? Crap. That wasn't part of the demo. Demo fail. You got to click the arrow. Oh, brilliant. 
I, I told you software. to get a Mac. 4,607 miles, 6 miles, 45 for, and I have November. So I don't know if you've had listened to any of your traffic control feeds, but that says that this plane was at this place at this time. Um, we, who was the guy's name? Do you remember? Oh, it's owned by some like no name LLC, another game rich people play. Yeah, so sorry. But, but I mean, here I could tell you something about him though, even though um, you know, there's not that much public information. It's a Sky, it's Skyhawk 736 Kilo Delta. It's a single engine piston from 1977. He was at Henderson landing on Wednesday, July 25th at about 10.30 in the morning. Um, which Henderson's just a couple miles south of here for you guys that know the area. Um, we looked him up with just his tail number. If he's here or ever hears about his presentation, it's nothing personal. Yours is just the first yeah. one I came upon. So it turns out that you can download every, every, anything from the internet these days, including like the recordings of every single air traffic control feed ever, because aircraft enthusiasts like to be enthusiastic about aircraft. <laughs> My grandpa still listens to the police scanner, so I, I have a friend it's that who weird. would listen to stuff from live ATC to go to sleep. It's kind of weird. Now you know why controllers go to sleep. It's boring. Yeah, and so there are websites like Live ATC, which so Live ATC has a Friday um, was monitoring 645 airport frequencies, which is almost every single major, cer certainly all the major airports in the Interesting US. Interesting ones get monitored. Yeah, so we were sitting there and we're thinking, hey, I have Siri on my phone, like, and I can talk to Siri and he can sort of understand me, and I mean, I can understand what these ATC guys are talking about, sort of. So why not just use speech recognition to? scrape all the tail numbers off of these public feeds. I mean, it's public radio. You're broad broadcasting to the public, so it's totally legal. And why not? So let me give you a basic uh, introduction to speech recognition. So you have this uh, sound wave. You break it up into little short bits. Then you analyze that. Just you take a Fourier transform, and then you like look at various interesting points of it. So you get some vectors in like a 13-dimensional space. So you have a sequence of those. So that's cool. We can deal with vectors. We just use linear algebra to make some uh, models. And the models let computers understand language. For the, so for the first job is you have these little things. And you have to uh, teach your computers to understand what like meaningful sounds are. So you have a phonemes, which is like oh or sh or it. And I thought that's what you rubbed on yourself to make girls like you. Yes. <laughs> So um, you build a hidden Markov model, which is, is, is a state machine. Um, I'm hoping people here know what state machines are. And you have a, but it's a state machine where you can't actually observe the state. So in, in fact, instead you observe an output that uh, is probabilistically de depends on the actual state. So you, yeah, it's not that complicated. There's the math for it is really simple and very efficient, which is primarily why people use it. And essentially, the output is what you observe. It's these little 13-dimensional vectors. And the state is what the actual phoneme is. So, and so th this is a common uh, thing they use in artificial intelligence. So the, natu there's a natu the mathematics behind this lets you ask a very natural question, which is what's the most likely pro tr set of transition probabilities in the state machine giving, given a particular output, like you know a sound file. So that corresponds to training. And another really natural question you can ask using the mathematics behind this is what's uh, the most likely s sequence of s states for you know, a given state machine given a particular output? And that corresponds to decoding a WAV file into a set of phonemes. Now, so that makes sense. So you can make sounds now. You can sort of understand that. But sound, you have to get the sounds to coalesce into words. So this is what various air traffic control things sound look like. So here on the top you have an, a... What does a, that even mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, some plane. American 1581 is just a standard commercial flight and... He's talking to Washington Departure. Uh, Washington Department says... They, basically, Washington Departure says to American 15, eight, flight 1581, <clears throat> radar. he has radar contact confirming. That's a required thing that ATC says. Um, and he's to climb and maintain 17,000 feet. And on the bottom, you have a private plane. You can see because it starts with November. So this is N6ZW. Uh, oh, sorry, N60W. It's OK. Uh, go talk to the center on this frequency. So there are a few ways to make language models. One of them is to specify a formal gra grammar, like what you do when you're writing a programming language. So there, and you, 
generally do that in something like the canals NAR, NAR format. So right there is the BNF for uh, BNF because that's a form of grammar in itself. It's like the compiler book. And theoretically, people in air traffic controller are supposed to speak in a formal grammar. However, that doesn't actually happen. There are constant divergences because they're humans, and humans As are stupid, and they out, don't follow rules. They should be made of computers. Yeah. So you can't really use that. Instead, you can do something else, which is pretty simple. You just get a lot of transcriptions, and you get sets of n words. Most of the time, you use n equals 3, because otherwise your graph gets really big. And you say, you know, given the last two words, what's the probability my third word is going to be something? So, and you get files like this. So the slash s is like, that's where the sentence ends. And there, now that's a language model. Because you have uh, some context from words behind previous. And you use this language model to build a graph of your little, uh, your acoustic model things, like your little hidden Markov models for each phoneme. And you, then you simply find the shortest path through the entire graph, and that gets you a sentence. What is so, it like a weighted thing where each note is weighted? It's a little yeah, more complicated than that. All right, time. I think it just clicked. So you, we used our CM, so <coughs> this we thought this was totally plausible. So we used our Carnegie Mellon Sphinx uh, rec speech recognition software. It's a uh, state of the art. It is probably better than your Google phones. Yeah, it's probably better than your Android phone's speech recognition. Um, it's unfortunately also academic software, which means it's sometimes difficult to work with and has lots of ac uh, undocumented features and has spent a bunch of time talking to the grad students who worked on it to figure out you know, how to do some very obvious things. Then we bought a corpus of air traffic control data. It turns out that in the 90s, the DARPA tried to automate air traffic control because you know it's expensive and computers were cool back then. Or at least the transcribing. It would be very useful to have complete transcripts of all ATC recordings. Yeah. Um, they're, they're kept indefinitely by the FAA for liability purposes. <laughs> so um, and to have it automatically, I mean, transcription sucks. I mean, anybody who, I mean, look at doctor's offices. They spend a ton on transcription. And they've tried to automate it for ages. In the 90s, it sure didn't work. Yeah, so uh, back then, BBN Technologies made a giant corpus of uh, various recordings from several airports. Like and 70 they hours. Describe them well. And so they failed at their task back then because they had a slightly harder problem, which was that they had even shittier computers and they were trying to completely understand what was going on um, rather than just pick out tail numbers. Yeah, they wanted, they wanted all the words accurate. Where yeah, the, not just all the words accurate. They wanted to actually be able to like automate the. Um, the positioning of the planes, or the, the routing, based purely on the, uh, uh, just purely by speech recognition. And, and that a, didn't work out very well. And there's a bunch of things that don't even, there aren't even words in uh, use in use by the FAA. Waypoints and stuff that it just have, uh, yeah. like random letters that we pronounce. Like so with us, the. we had uh, slightly different issues. It was had a simple problem because we don't need to quite recognize as, re recognize quite as much, but it still was a shitty signal, and computers are still kind of slow. And uh, so with us, we, ha we want to make our system scale to many airports. So that's a problem because different airports have different landmarks, which, corresponds to, which correspond to slightly different language models. And we also had uh, transcripts that, you know, from this uh, corpus, and a lot of them did suck. So we had to kind of filter for that. I don't feel like I got what I paid for with that, really. Yeah, so we, uh, we also so we used uh, about 50 tr personally transcribed utterances from every individual airport we added to our system to, to adapt an existing acoustic model uh, to, to the characteristics of that particular, the recordings from that particular airport. Uh, we used both, if you're a speech recognition expert, here are some buzzwords that should mean something to you. I can't really explain all the math behind this too, this fast. Um, so we used, uh, we, uh, I have ATC provides uh, 16 kilohertz clips, those 16 kilohertz uh, audio files, but all those high frequencies and radio actually are just pretty much noise, and certainly you can't pick out how the, the little bits that people use of those frequencies. As a pilot, it's hard, um, yeah. even to hear it, even for me in the cockpit. Um, it's a challenge to understand what's said every time. So we just downsampled everything and trade an 8 kilohertz model. Uh, and so yeah, and that worked pretty well. If you want to, us to add an airport, you should send us like five minutes of a transcribed speech. And 
we trained a lang and from this, we got 70% word accuracy based on some tests. So that doesn't sound very high, but that's pretty good because this, uh, things like per airport landmarks were much lower because they're different and, you know, that's not, that's obviously not going to be recognized very well. Things like numbers and the NATO alphabet, which conveniently are what tail numbers are made of, was the recognition and accuracy for that is higher because it's the same everywhere and there's a lot of training data for it. So that's not too bad. You also, we also found that since, you know, people say their tail numbers like a hundred times, well not hundred, but over the course of arriving to an airport, uh, certainly more than three They're times. They're going to identify themselves many times, so uh, requisitely. It's actually required um, before every radio transmit. Yeah, because you of that, yourself. you're almost certainly going to catch the airplane as it goes in, um, because um, there's, you know, some variation in speech recognition. It's not going to work every time because it's a hard signals processing problem. But you're, so you're almost certainly going to get all the airplanes that come in, but you're also going to get a bunch of false negatives. So, sorry, a bunch of false positives because whatever recognizes something the wrong way. So, yeah, so you're never going to get perfect recognition accuracy with something like this, but although you can, in fact, track a bunch of flights. Uh, yes. Does anyone here want to find out how you can track all the planes yourself with really, really high recognition accuracy in the United States? If you don't, oh yeah, that's the, the right answer is naturally no. But in fact, the FAA, that the whole um, that oh, ASDI feed, jobs. it is you can sign up for it yourself. Now it used to cost money; you used to like have to provide your own line. But now uh, there's a just uh, an e you can search for ASDI feed, and you know, and there's a page on the FAA website. You have to send an email. We've sent this email. You send this email. They reply you with this really nice thing saying, "Oh yeah, all you need to do is just set up this, you know." I've, yeah, there we are. This is what you need. This, these are the technical requirements for tracking <coughs> all the planes. Um, you have to send an email. You have to have a really, really, really big bandwidth because this is like big for you know the early 90s. You have to know how to parse XML and set up a secure VPN. And you have to sign some forms that say that anyone who's on the bar, you can't disseminate that information. Uh, um, but that doesn't stop you naturally from disseminating, say, say, internally within your company or acting on it. And you can find out every, what everything's going on. Yeah, this Press next. Frankly, next page down space. So that's what the uh, the feed looks like. It's just super easy. Um, if there are two versions, there's one where you can find out uh, things five minutes later. Like there's a little delay, and that way you can't get like there's an auditing process that might occasionally come ac across you if you want live data. But instead, if you're okay with, you know, flight plan data five minutes later than real, which is totally okay if you're like TMZ and trying to get Jay-Z. Because remember, uh, you'll, get, you'll get the flight plan the day ahead You don't ahead ever of time. have to be audited. So seriously, everyone in this room should do this. Just if you, <laughs> no, you just can. <clears throat> yeah, you can't tell <clears throat> anyone else about what you see there, but you can track every plane. You know, can now find out exactly where Rush Limbaugh is flying. So is not that great because it means that there's, you know, this whole bar thing, this, uh, a lot, there are a lot of private aircraft owners that think that their flights are private. In fact, they're not. There are a bunch of people doing this. There, the FAA has a list of the people subscribed to the SDI feeds, and there's 64 groups. Actually, However, it wasn't even 64 groups. It was like several groups were named like multiple times with multiple people. Yeah. So it might be like 30, 30 yeah. groups are named as having subscribed. That doesn't sound that bad. However, if, if you look at the forms that you have to sign to get a, a copy of the ASDI feed, you can opt out of being on this list. So, and we, you know, we sent our email and... I'm signing up. As of Friday, there were 30 subscribers on the wait queue to be connected, um, which means that the kind of very strongly implies that the number of total people subscribed is much, much, much larger than 64. So there's a few uses for this. Um, one, you know, you can track every person, every interesting person ever, or not quite, but, you know, find out who Rush Limbaugh's cheating on now. Um, and you can even say, you know, you can go to that airport and interview the person. You just can't say that you got, you found out where they got, how they got there from the flight plane. Uh, also, if you, like, have a company with, like, a competitor or something, and, the, you know, There's you have a, a sufficient scale that the competitor owns a private plane, this might be a useful thing for you to do. 